Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, I want to introduce Ingrid Arredondo. Um, so as a parent, I try and learn from everybody around me, educators like Peter and all the parents around me. And of all the people around me, I feel like Ingrid has taught me so much. Um, I, whenever we're together, I have so many new ideas. Um, and so I thought, based on what she's doing with her daughter, she would be great to teach a class here. Um, she takes this deliberate approach to teach the right values and instill confidence in her family and her daughter. Um, and so without further ado, here's Ingrid to talk about unspoiling, not spoiling your children. Sorry, I'm not used to this technology. Can you guys, is that okay? Hi. Um, thanks so much for having me. I want to first thank Nicole for inviting me. I'm so flattered and to say that I feel the same about her. I, we teach each other things over the years, so I really appreciate that you said that, Cole. Thank you. Um, so you're here because maybe there's somebody in your life that you want to help along to maybe not be spoiled, or maybe you don't have children yet and you want to prevent them from spoil. And frankly, I kind of feel like sometimes these lessons can apply to not just children, but also adults. Um, so how did I get here? Um, I used to work at a corporation. Um, it was the largest adult beverage company in the world, and I was a global program director. So basically, I had to manage a lot of people to um, implement technology. Um, I'm not technical, um, but I would work with the people who were technical. So I kind of feel like my education started there, working with people and mentoring them and trying to bring out the best in them. Because I feel like that's what you are as a parent. You're really trying to bring out the best in your children. Um, and for a boss, you're bringing out the best in the people who work for you. So then I had a baby and moved to Connecticut. <laughs> um, so the playroom. When you walk around people's homes, um, you see these playrooms. They're huge. They have every toy you can think of. And it's beautiful and it's amazing, but you wonder, do the children even play with everything? And, um, and still they weren't really sharing all the time, even though they had all these toys. Everybody seemed to want the same toy. Children's roles over time. So if you think about years and years ago, most people lived on farms. They grew up on farms. They had so many children. They were born kind of in a way to be a worker, part of the family. Um, they were working on a farm, not a resort. Okay, so they weren't kind of um, gaining everything and having everybody do things for them. They were surviving. Rulers of the house. So now things have changed that they're not workers, they're becoming more like princesses. So they're being put on a pedestal. Everything they do is amazing. And that's not to say that they're not. They are amazing. They're our children. We're excited. We're proud. They came from us. But we're putting them on a pedestal, and they're having this image of themselves that they can do no wrong. They're absolutely perfect. And by the way, all of these examples I saw in myself, too. So please don't feel like I think I'm perfect. I'm not. I mess up all the time. And I try to learn from my mistakes instead of wallowing in them, which I know can be difficult not to do sometimes. So then on to Frontier House. Um, does anybody remember, it's like a long time ago, on PBS they had these shows, like one was like 1840 House or something, one was Frontier House, it was like their version of Survivor and like a reality show, and it was awesome. Um, so I loved it. So they had these normal families who they said, let's take you out of, from diverse um, socioeconomic backgrounds and everything, and had them own a house or have a house and they had to basically um, survive through a winter or plan to survive through winter by chopping up wood, gathering up food. So anyway, to kind of move it along, there was this one family and they had two girls and they were from Malibu, it's super wealthy, super affluent, had everything they could want. And they were working on this farm and they were so happy, they were always smiling and then at the end of the show, they were sitting in this hot tub, looking at this beautiful view over the Pacific Ocean, and they're like, I'm so bored, there's nothing to do. And I remember just being so touched by that, and I didn't even have children then. Like, they, children were even a thought in my mind, and that's always resonated with me still. Um, so, research. 
how do they even get all this information I'm going to present to you? Research, so um, reading. As Nicole said, you observe what people do. I observe children. Um, I just see what happens. And I kind of compiled everything together. There are, I'd say, three main books that really developed who I am as a parent. And I thank God for them because they really influenced me in how to speak to my kid. Um, so one is how to talk so kids will listen and listen so your kids will talk. I love it. It has cartoons and everything. So it was easy for me to absorb. Um, and then what was the other one? Um, positive discipline. And then a huge one, which is going to be a big structure for today, is a book called The Opposite of Spoiled. Have you guys heard of any of these books? OK. Opposite of Spoiled is amazing. I, I had the opportunity and privilege to hear the author speak at my daughter's school. And he basically was talking about this. And it's basically conversations about money to have with your children. But it applies to so much more. So I kind of took kind of part of his structure, we'll see in a moment, and kind of put my own stuff in it um, to show my observations, what I do. I also wanted to make sure you know, just take what works. Not everything's going to work. Not everything you work in every single book or see, it's not going to work for you. Just take what works for you and then leave whatever doesn't work. Um, any questions before we get started? Okay. All right, overview. What is spoiled? Why we spoil? Why it's a bad thing? Um, what spoiled children have in common. I actually have that on my refrigerator, so I look at it all the time, so I'll show it to you. And how to unspoil, and then some Q&A. Spoiled defined. Um, so on the left, spoiled. On the right, not spoiled. I got these just from, like, I came up with some by myself. I looked in the dictionary. The one that I put the first at the top for both, you'll notice, is grateful and ungrateful. I think that's probably the most important part. Be grateful for things, the people in your life, your experiences, just everything. Um, if you're selfish, excuse me, overprotected, are they being rescued all the time? Are they materialistic? They're self-doubting. Even though they're getting everything and having their way, they're, a lot of them do doubt themselves. Can I really do it? I'm being rewarded for all these things, but did I, do I really deserve it? Um, they're impatient. They're corrupted is one I got from the dictionary. I just, I don't know. Um, so some of these might sound really kind of extreme. Arrogant, gluttonous, harmed. That was from the dictionary. Um, not spoiled, grateful, humble, grounded, gener well, generous, patient, giving, content, happy, confident, and well-mannered. So what I had read is that when you're a child, learning all these things and not being spoiled helps you obviously become a better adult, more capable to handle um, real life situations. So I'm sure you guys have looked at this statistic. I think it was in the bio that came out that about 80% of parents think that their children may be at least somewhat spoiled. I mean, I, I feel like it. I even implement these and they're, you know, I still have to battle with it. I mean, she's, I think my child is great. I'm sure we all do, but there's still the little bits you want to keep you know, try to keep out and keep them grateful. So why do we spoil? Um, I put these two together. I just want to show like, why, because I understand, like, I've gone through a couple of these, and I know other people have certain things that go on in their lives, but we're tired. We're bit like, we're, we're work some of us are working. We're busy, we have little time, we feel guilty. Um, it's easier to do everything ourselves. This is a big one. It's so, especially somebody who could be like a type A personality, or not even, like you just want to do everything, you want to be perfect, you want to be great. Welcome to children. They're not um, perfect, um, and they're not easy. So we expect too little of them, So and also we have little faith in them, and they can feel that. So um, there's so many things these kids can do that we're like, oh, like even myself, I didn't let my daughter wash her hair by herself for a while. It's like, oh my gosh, she's leaving soap in her hair. I can't have that, it's gonna be gross. And then I'm like, I have to let it go. Her hair might be a little gross, but she's gonna, she has to do it herself. Um, so just think about how kids were, I don't know, 100 years ago. They were working by the time they were like not even 10, some of them, like a lot of them. Um, you know, they were just so much more independent. And I know it's a different world, and not every single one of these is going to apply, um, but just wanted to give you some examples. I feel lucky to be able to have them. Maybe some parents had difficulty conceiving, 
and they're like, oh my God, I worked so hard to have this baby. I just feel so lucky. Or they're an only child. I have an only child. They get everything. Um, my best friend in high school growing up, she, sorry? Oh, <laughs> should I? Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, my best friend in high school growing up, she was an only child, and she, um, you know, was a great person, but she was a little selfish, she didn't like to share, so we said that she had OCS, only child syndrome. Um, so that's a difficult thing to combat. Um, fun, it's fun to buy things. You know, it's fun to buy things for them. You know, it's cute when you have a little girl, whatever, you want to buy cute stuff. Um, and you don't want them to get hurt or to see them fail. And here's a big one. In Fairfield County, we're competing. Um, not just children. Children see things that they want, but the parents. So they see things they're like, oh my god, I have to do that. Oh, they did this vacation, we have to do that. And not to say that a vacation is bad. I think that experiences are wonderful. I think things are wonderful. It's just making sure that there's a respect around them and a gratitude for them. And then as a result, there's more compensation. We're compensating our children for not maybe doing enough. Um, less consistency. This is huge. Um, it's kind of like dog training. Um, you have to be consistent. If you don't want the dog jumping off the couch, you have to be consistent. Um, and we'll get to that more. Less teaching. This, I feel, is one of our primary roles as a parent. You're teaching them. If you're not teaching them, if you're not communicating with your child, who's teaching them? More intervention, um, over parenting. You, know, you don't want, again, it comes back to like, you don't want them to be hurt, you don't want to see them fail. Um, little time to bond and connect. This is huge, in fact. There's everything in parenting, everything in life is a balance. So you're, you know, you sometimes have to be the hammer, but you're also going to be the loving parent. So you're not just telling them, you can't do this, you can't do that. They have to know that it's coming from a place of love. So I'll explain more about that. Um, okay, award participation. Personally, I feel as though all of the participation awards are diluting the effect of actually winning something. Um, so Gabrielle is in karate, and listen, I'm not saying she's the best karate, she's not, she's not good at karate, but she likes it, and she came in last, and, and she still got a participation award, and I kind of wish that they didn't. You know, I loved watching her, but I don't want them to give her an award, because I want her to just be happy that she's there, and if they, then she won, then I want her to get an award. So I know people feel differently about that, but that was that's just my personal perspective and birthday parties. How many of you have like every weekend scheduled with birthday parties and like, yeah, we feel like we have, you know, life and we have all the birthday parties. It was just so many. And especially when you're in a new school, you want to meet people, you want to socialize. So they can be a great thing. But I guess um, just all the things, the number of, of people, the number of children, the amount of sugar, especially if they have back-to-back -back birthday parties, those are the worst. Um, it's just too much stimulation. And in fact, the um, head of the lower school at my daughter's school, um, it was great. She gave permission to the parents to be like, listen, this is not good for them at this stage in their development. It's great to go to some parties, but maybe only if it's like their best friends and um, someone they're close to or whatever the reason may be or maybe just like do once a month or whatever kind of rule you want to put on it. But it's just too much for them. Um, not just the sugar, but just the stimulation and then the presence. And we'll talk more about this in detail a little bit later. And it's all about them. So everything is about them. They, you know, we change our lives around them. We do this. They can interrupt us at any time. And that's really not the way it should be, um, in, in my opinion. Again, I'm not saying that every single thing I say should is what it is. I'm not having judgment on any way somebody wants to raise their parent. These are just things, some things that it might be. And again, pick and choose what you think resonates with you. Um, and then sometimes they may wonder, is it deserved? You know, do I deserve all this attention? Do I deserve to get all these toys? And yeah, maybe they're not thinking out loud, but maybe subconsciously they are. Do I really deserve to get this award? Um, and then they're not valued. So is spoiled really a bad thing? Um, 
Well, I put down a couple things that I could think of um, that would be impacting them as they get older and of course as they're still children. One of the biggest things we're trying to do, you know, obviously protecting them and everything, is we're trying to build values. So they're lacking values and lessons to cope with real life. That is it. Like that is one of the ultimate things for me. I want to make sure that she can cope with real life when I'm not here anymore. Um, they can be uh, selfish with little regard for others and other people's boundaries. They're not willing to strive. They expect everything to be given to them um, or done for them. They don't learn to fail and they can't handle setbacks. Personally, I mean, I've I've had failures in my life. I feel like I've had more successes. I feel like I've um, learned from my mistakes and grown. Some, um, maybe I haven't learned from some mistakes as well. But I wouldn't be able, I'd be, I feel like I would be so fragile if I just went from my parents protecting me and then, hey, okay, here you go. Like, there's no way you can handle that kind of environment if you're in a corporate environment and not able to handle criticisms or, oh my gosh, this launch didn't work or, whatever or I didn't get that raise that I wanted um, but they would still think that they deserved it because I'm me. Um, unable to be independent, they're bored with the inability to be alone and entertain themselves. Okay, there's the constant barrage of the iPads, the videos, the um, whatever, the games, everything, the parent doing everything to complain with them and I'm not saying don't play with your kids at all. It's just keeping balance with everything. Um, unable to contribute to and feel successful in life and having a feeling of unworthiness and incapability and self-doubt. So those are just some things. I'm sure you guys are coming up with some things in your head of what else, you know, would be bad about being spoiled. And then I try to always go back to my guiding principle. It's what's my job as a parent? So before we talk about some of that, stages of development of when you're a parent. And this is seriously over oversimplified. Everybody who has potty trained or handled lice or anything like that, you see that this, and I haven't handled lice, thank God, um, <laughs> um, is simplified. So the first one is pick me up. So you have a baby, you pick them up, you hold them tight, you're protecting them. You put them down. So you've been teaching them, you've been working with them, and finally they can go down, they're running around. And then finally, let me go. We have to let go at some point. And when you do let them go, have you prepared them? And I just wrote her, sorry, I should make that them, um, but I'm talking about my daughter. Have I prepared her for the real world? Will she be independent, happy, and successful when I'm gone? Will she have respect for others and for herself, self-respect? Have I helped her to be the best version of herself? This is the one I always go back to. Like, will she be the best? I want her to be the best version of herself. She does not have to be like, I don't know, a nuclear physicist or be the best in karate. I don't care. I just want her to be the best version of herself, be great with people, or be kind to people, respect herself, um, and be able to function and have great values as an adult. So I just kind of put some of these questions to pepper you and just maybe, I don't know, trigger something um, to make you think about things. Do I give them too much? Do I hate going to birthday parties on the weekends? Do I feel like I'm being played? Um, children are master manipulators, okay? They're really smart. They can see everything. They sense what's going on with you. Um, I love this one, because my daughter actually threw it back at me the other day. I'm like, do, do you feel like you're treated or thought of as a servant? And so one day I said to Gabrielle, I'm like, I'm not your maid. And two days ago she said that to me. She's like, I'm not your maid, I, can't, I don't have to get that. So like, you're gonna get pushed back. Don't think this is gonna be like easy peasy, like rolling, you can see her saying that. Um, just rolling this out and not having any pushback. You are gonna have bumps in the road, but I'm gonna show you a couple tips on how you can kind of implement some of these. Um, where was I? Oh, lacking connection, how can I stop them from asking for things? That's gonna be a huge part of the topic today. We, there's so much to talk about. So I really had to focus it on um, like things and personal possessions. So, and we'll see other things too. Um, how's your relationship with your spouse or significant other? Is everything about the kid? Um, oh, and this one, we, the spread. Have you guys ever heard of it? I think my sister-in-law made that up, right? She and I were talking about it. 
like the spread, the toys. Oh my God, where do they come from? They just like seriously spread all over and all over your house. I'm gonna tell you what to do. Uh, get rid of that. Um, do you hold your adult time secrets? So this comes back to you. You have to create your boundaries. You have to make sure that your adult time is sacred. Do you constantly let them interrupt you? And I actually saw this once from somebody that was at my house with their child. They were ignoring the child. I was ignoring because we were having adult time. We said, just wait a minute, you know, once we're finished talking. And the little girl came over and smacked her mom in the face. So if they're not going to get attention from talking to you, they're going to find a way. They want their attention. Just imagine that little kid in 10 years. What's, what's that going to look like when they're a teenager? Now you can kind of give them information and teach them. That may not be so easy when they're teenagers, so now's the time to do it. Do they clean up their messes? Do you do everything for them? Are they polite? Okay, this is what I have on my refrigerator. This guy, I, I feel, is brilliant and has changed my life um, as far as being a parent. I feel like what he said has changed Gabrielle's life um, now and in the future. Maybe that's a strong statement to make, but I really believe in these things that he wrote. Spoiled children tend to have four primary things in common, though they don't all have to be present at once. They have few chores or other responsibilities. There aren't many rules that cover their behavior or schedules. Parents and others lavish, I love that word, um, them with time and assistance. And it's not just parents. I know there's the grandparents. I know there's the well-meaning friends that give presents and whatever and books. Um, I'll stop doing that. Um, and and I'll tell you what what Nicole and I do now. And like I have been doing it with my nieces and nephews, and it's helped. And they have a lot of material possessions. I'm going to really focus on that as I mentioned. So I wanted to make sure you knew that this was um, from the opposite of spoiled conversations about money with your children. I just that's my description of it. That's not what it is. And then the next ten slides. It's kind of a, co a combination of um, all of my information I've gathered over the couple years, but using this structure. So it's like, all right, they have a few chores, and then I kind of put some things that I think you could do, um, and along with some of the things he thought you could do as well. Chores and responsibilities. They have few chores and responsibilities. So the first thing that needs to be done is create and agree on age-appropriate chores. And this is going to sound crazy when I say this, and it it sounds a little new agey, whatever. You have a family meeting, and I know the thought, like I was thinking, like, oh my god, I don't have time for a family meeting, I can't deal. And I'm not saying have a family meeting every single week at all, because it's not going to happen, because um, we tried. Um, but periodically, just have a meeting, and then you talk, actually talk with your kids, because they have about this. I'm sure you talk with your kids. But they have great ideas. So when you go, you speak with them, and we'll talk about family meeting, or if we don't get to that, there's a slide in the back that can be distributed that has a summary of what to do with it. But you both agree on what the chores would be. So ask them first. So what do you think you could do as chores? What do you think that you would like to do? And then the things that they say, you will have more buy-in. But you have to agree on it. It can't be like, oh, I'm going to um, brush my teeth. OK, no, that's not the one thing that you're going to do. We're going to agree on every, everything together. And then you're going to teach and show and do it with them. A lot of times we don't take the time because we just don't have time. We're tired. We want to you know, read our book. We want to watch our show, whatever. Um, more than that, we just we don't have time. We're working. Um, but by teaching them and showing them what they can do, how they can do something, they're going to be more likely to do it. Personally, I hate thank you notes because when I was a kid, my mom tried to force me to do thank you notes, and it's not that I wasn't grateful. I didn't know how to do it. And I didn't know how to kind of express that I didn't know how to do it, so I just was being a pain in the neck and didn't do it. Um, and so to this day, I'm like, oh my god, I don't want to write a thank you note. So if you just kind of teach them, do it alongside with them, I think that will help. Don't expect perfection or speed. It's going to be a little bit sloppy um, at first. So just make sure that you understand that. Like with Gabrielle's hair, with the shampoo in it, and it still looks fine. It looks fine, but it's not It's not perfect, but that's OK. You're creating positive habits and experiences right now. Okay, That's what this is all about. It's not having everything be perfect. 
never punish by giving chores because that's going to put a negative um, feeling behind actually doing the chore. And if things don't go as planned, as they won't um, every single time, um, review at next family meeting. Okay, so maybe like two months goes by, like, all right, let's have a family meeting, and then you can talk about it more. Chore ideas. This is not a total list. These are just some of the things that we do. Um, so things she has to do for herself. Clothes in the hamper, clean up her toys, obviously, her room, play area. This is going to come into play with, see, a lot of material possessions. Household, I have her water the plants. Um, she doesn't really help me need, but I want her to. That's next on my list. She picks vegetables from the garden, and I want to make it sound like it's like this great garden. It's like I have two tomato plants and like a cucumber. So she goes, and it's great. She like goes in there and like has a snack on there. Also, um, feed and water the animals. Set and clear the table. She wants to help cook. Like she told me, she's like, you know what? I really want to start helping you cook instead of doing X. I'm like, okay. So now she's helping me to cook, which is great. You know, how how much is it? But I'm glad. Unload um, and put away some. Like some of the groceries, maybe she'll just take it out of the bag, empty the dishwasher, pick up dog poop in the yard. Um, when we get a cat, if Edward someday lets me, um, I want to get a cat again. Um, so those are some of the things that we have her do. Some of them, like this, it's gross, but you know what? I'm not hiring somebody to do it. It's crazy. My kid is going to do it, and I'll do it with her. Um, and I, this will come in later, but I give her like five cents each for a bag of poop. So I'll tell you more about that stuff later. It works. Um, rules for behavior. Oh, sorry. Before I go on, we're, are we just doing Q and A at the very end, or okay. rules for behavior and schedule? So this is the the second one. There aren't many rules that cover their behavior or schedules, and it doesn't mean like any. I'm sure you guys have some rules and whatever, but maybe it's getting some, maybe even more, some more structure around it. Um, so here's just some ideas that I had that are important to me. So getting ready in the morning and bedtime, at morning and bedtime. The meals, we have um, structure around that, um, and I have more examples, but basically kids eat a lot of junk, um, and sometimes it's hard to cook. So like one little thing I do is you have a rule, you have to eat vegetables first, and I'll, like it's almost like I do it in courses, so I'll put like the um, the veggies out, or if it's in the morning, I'll put like a little bowl of fruit or whatever, um, and then I'll give her. And if she doesn't want it and complains, it's always the rule is, you know what, you don't have to eat it, but one bite to be polite, and that kind of works. Um, homework. I don't know how many of you guys have kids that have homework yet, um, but they procrastinate, they don't want to do it. So it's always good to have um, something positive that they can do if they use their time wisely and efficiently. So it's almost bu like budgeting. So you're having them budget their time. So the faster you finish your homework, the faster you can watch like whatever Powerpuff Girls or whatever she's watching now. Um, and also it's kind of strap and, and pulls from my time too. If I'm waiting for her to finish her homework, we would be there for forever because it's, oh, I want to do this, whatever. So I'm like, Gabrielle, I will give you 20 minutes of my time. After that, I have to make dinner or I have to do that. And then I'll follow through on it. You have to, that, like, that's one of the most important things. You have to follow through. Like, if it can be hard, there's going to be screens. So try not to do all this stuff when you don't have a lot of time um, and, like, you have a big, meeting or something at work that day or it's the morning it's it's hard but try to think about the timing for some of these things um manners and speaking to others the interruptions which i mentioned the other day when i was uh the other year when i was talking with my friend and her kid came over and snatched her um respect for boundaries in adult time this is important to my husband and to me because we love our child but you know what that's not all we are and you have to make sure um, you create a very strong bond with your spouse, significant other, and as soon as she's finished eating, she brings the plates up, and then she can do something, but then that's our adult time. She has to get ready, whatever, and then, you know, one of us will go up and read her story and do this other thing that I'm going to tell you about that helps create bonding. Um, next one, lavishing time and assistance. 
So parents and others. So I know maybe sometimes that can be, you can only do so much. Um, it can be the grandparents. I'm not saying it's always a bad thing that the grandparents might lavish or whatever. But it's not our job to entertain our children. I know that may seem hard to believe with everything we're seeing these days. Um, especially like with iPads and everything. They want to, and I love that my daughter wants to play with me, but you know what? That's not all I have to do. Like, think about how it was 100 years ago. People had to do things at home. Maybe they were doing this or that. And the child would be with them, but helping them do whatever they were doing or spending time. And you can still spend quality time with them. I think that that's maybe the main gist I'm trying to get here is instead of kind of, I don't know, a tough time when you're arguing, you don't want to play Barbies, whatever. I hate playing Barbies. Just, I really hate it. I'm not good at it. And that's what she wants to play the most of all. Um, but you can, and, but then maybe that will be the quality time. Maybe you'll take them to do something, but you don't have to spend a ton of time every single week with them entertaining them. There are other things that you can do. Um, oh, so 10 to 15 minutes during the week of bedtime. That's just what I do. Maybe of less time, but I do this thing, like I'll read with her. And this amazing thing I do to have more of a connection with her is we do sad, mad, lad, but we write it almost like a journal or draw pictures. And then she'll, I can't remember, like sometimes she'll do hers first, sometimes I'll do mine first. And it's an amazing way to know what they're doing because they don't want to tell you things. Like, you're like, hey, what happened today? Like, nothing. And you're like, oh my god, I know something, ha I know things happen. So it's a way for them later in the day to draw, this is what made me sad, and she'll draw a picture and you try to guess what it is, and then mad, and then draw what it is, and then glad and draw what it is. And so we'll guess what it is. And she'll be like, no, don't guess what it is. I know you're going to guess what it is. And then I'll do mine. So she'll know what happened in my day, too. And it's kind of therapeutic for me, too. So like what made me really sad. And obviously, you have to um, edit what you're going to put you know, in it if it's not age appropriate or whatever. Um, so I, so personally, I love that. I kind of, I heard somebody say sad and I'm glad they just tell their kid about it. But I kind of moved it into doing the journaling thing at night because I, I like to journal sometimes. Not, not all the time, like once in a while. Um, give them time and space to fail. It's okay if they fail, okay? Like if they forget their bathing suit, you say, bring your bathing suit, and then they're like, oh my god, I want my bathing suit, too bad. And, and that said, you have to pick your battles, because sometimes, whatever, you just need to kind of let it go, but other times you really need to let them fail um, and figure out a cause and effect like, if you don't do it, then this is what's going to happen. OK, um, so that was it for the four points. But I just wanted to mention these last things um, on chores, rules, behavior, and assistance. Assistance, you're not their, you're their parent. You're not their servant. Don't do everything for them. Um, they're not going to be able to do things for themselves if, if you don't. Um, and it'll make your life a lot easier, too. They should really be cleaning up after themselves. They should clean up their spills, their messes, get their own food and snacks after um, they ask you for it. Um, have responsibilities and pitch in as part of a family. I heard a really great quote about kids should feel like they're living um, on, not on a resort, what was it, on a, a ranch? They're not on a resort, they're on a ranch. Okay? They're not there to be on a vacation. They're there because they're part of the family they're pitching in. And I know it's like, oh, that's great. Oh, thanks for telling me all this stuff, but how do I make them do it? So I'll tell you that in a minute. Oh, oops, yeah, and a lot of material possessions. OK, I'm going to focus on this one for a little while. Um, so if they have a lot of material possessions, they will not value it. Um, it's just too many things. I think I mentioned before, well, like some, some kid, well, it actually wasn't Gabrielle, but it was another kid who said, I don't want that. I already have that. And it was like, oh my god, it was so shocking. Just the level of not being grateful for something. And like, oh my gosh. And if if this makes you happy now or not even happy now, what's going to happen when you're in the real world? Stop the toy spread. Too much junk everywhere. So we're going to talk about cleaning out toys, books, and clothing projects. It's, it's very fun, I promise. Um, stop buying an allowance and help them to think of others by giving and donating. Okay, so here's the action plan. Here's your to-do list for when you're ready. 
And I highly recommend, don't look too whole of this at once because it's gonna fail if you do, I mean, unless you're superhuman. I'm not. I just did a couple things at once. And this was the easiest thing for me to do first because I could start <laughs> doing it by myself and I didn't have to like engage with her quite yet with some of them. But do the, first do the clean out. So you're gonna break it up into four piles, address the clothes, the um, toys, whatever you wanna hit first. So do four piles, what you're gonna keep, throw away, give away, and donate. Do not have them help in this first phase because everything, you know, like, okay, I can tell you've done this. Um, they wanna save a piece of paper with, like, and it's not like I was throwing out her nice drawing. It was like, I don't even know what it was. It was ripped, whatever. That one. First, do it alone, include them. Have them help and think of others and donate. So when you do bring them in after that, you're gonna do a second phase, be like, all right, can you pick things that you don't want? Let's think of other kids who don't have, some kids don't have anything, and explain it to them. And don't, a big thing is don't be afraid of the questions. I know some of these questions can be weird and hard, like, and not just about this kind of thing, but kind of a quote I said to my husband about something, like, listen, if you make it weird, it's gonna be weird. So just don't make it weird. Just like talk and age of her really and whatever and explain things to them. Because, I mean, again, do you want them to come and ask you questions or do you want them to go to somebody else you know, that maybe you don't agree with their values? Repeat, it's gonna go on, okay? But we have now whittled it down to like two little cabinets downstairs. It's awesome, so. And then, so that's great. Now you've got things kind of un under control, but then how do you stop it? This is probably gonna be the hardest part for people, and it might take a little bit of a while, um, but just stop buying stuff. And I'm gonna tell you what I did and some of the things that I learned in the, the book that I read. Um, purchase only, you're cutting them off. Purchase only for birthdays, and I know it sounds mean, but just listen, I have some other things. Birthdays, Christmas or Hanukkah, special vacations, like if you go to Disney or whatever, um, and occasions. But, and this is gonna come in with the allowance that's coming up in a minute, you give them a budget. I know it sounds crazy, but I gave Gabrielle, I'm like, Gabrielle, you can spend $25 on anything you want. You have no idea the care and patience she took <laughs> to pick it out. Like, in fact, she put, she's like, no, I don't really want it. Um, she didn't say it like that, but that sounded very bratty the way I said that. I don't really want that, it's not what I want. And then she's like, what if I don't see anything I want? I'm like, you can keep the money. So that will come more in. It's fun using our children as experiments. I mean, in positive ways, but. Um, ask, this is gonna be really hard. Um, ask others to not lavish them with gifts and everything. Give, ask them, maybe give them money for savings. And there's more on that, I'll tell you more, it's not. I'm not just leaving you with that. Have a limit um, on the amount. Like for Christmas, we have Carol has so many aunts and uncles and cousins, and we love them all. But they would give so many like presents, and they just get numb with the amount of things that they get. They don't even care anymore. So um, we kind of started by saying, "Hey, can you just do something that's less than fifty dollars?" And then last year, I'm like, "Why don't we do an activity?" So instead of doing something, we did. Um, Got to, and it was more expensive, that's fine. It's just, it was something that was more of a return on investment. It was something that they would remember more, they would have more value. So always think of that word with like value. What you're giving them or what they're receiving, is it something that they'll remember? Will they value it for a long time? Will it make a difference in their lives? So we took like the whole family, the cousins, the aunts and the uncles, we went to see the Lion King together and then had dinner after. Was it less expensive? No way. But it was awesome. Like I still remember, like I don't remember what toy she got last year, um, you know. But we all had such a great time. So we're gonna do it again this year. And it, it just increases their appreciation, their value. And I had one other thing I wanted to say about it that I put in my note. Yeah. So just the objects and experiences they create lasting experiences and that have real value and meaning. So just try to keep that in your focus as a guiding principle. Stuff is gonna get in there. I know there's gonna be junk and whatever. It's just really trying for this to be, you know, most of the time.
But I have to tell you, I really don't get her stuff. I, you know, it's and she doesn't care. Like she has so much stuff to play with anyway, and she's she's happy. So, how do they get toys? You give them an allowance. Now there's a debate. Do I give my child allowance based on you know nothing, just being there, or based on chores? I personally do it based on not chores. Okay, just here's your allowance. The reason is because they are going to learn how to work and everything in the future and other things. I want them to learn the value of money, figuring it out. Otherwise, she'd never have money. <laughs> I, like if she like pushed back on like a toy, if I used it as you know hold over her head or um, a consequence, it's not going to work. Give them something that they really can feel, like the iPad. She feels the iPad. Um, not having the iPad, so that's what I use. Also, I know I skipped to the end, but it's seen as be, being more entrepreneurial than a worker. So if you're only just like doing your chores and working for a wage, there's a, a sense of boredom about it. They're not as motivated to do it. But when you get an allowance, or if your parents say, you know what, why don't you tell me, think of some things that you could um, do around the house to make some more money. I'll give you X, Y, Z for this. And then they start thinking, how can I make money? How can I do this? And it'll be more than just a lemonade stand. You know, they're gonna they're gonna want their toys. They're gonna want whatever. So that's my personal opinion. Um, it gives them a feeling of independence. That's great, mom. Can you buy me this? Maybe you'll say you'll probably say no. Maybe you'll say yes. But you don't. They don't need your okay. They can just buy whatever they want. And I put exceptions. I mean, she can't get candy. So that was my only exception. I'm sure as time goes on, it'll be like. Um, whatever, like crazy thing. I, the, the examples that they use in the book are like leather pants, tattoos, push-up bras, um, things like that. God, that's so far ahead, but it'll come quick. Um, so just make up whatever your limits are that they should have. And, oh yeah, they care more about things when they pay for it by themselves. She got this bird. Thing. Um, she loves this thing. She brings it to camp every day. Now all the other kids are getting involved. And that's the example. Like someone sees it and everybody else wants it. Um, it's this bird and it can kind of talk back to it. It's like a little cage. It's really cute. Um, anyway, so she cares about it a lot because it's hers and she paid for it. It helps them understand money and value and create appreciation. I mean, I don't know how many of you here actually had your parents, maybe you have, sat down with you and your kid and explained money to you. Like saving it, do you value it? And just really understanding it. I think that especially girls, they don't get the same education with money as men do. Also, boys tend to ask more questions than girls do. So just because the girls aren't asking the questions doesn't mean that you shouldn't give them the information. Okay, so this probably should have been a separate slide, but okay, here's the crux of it. I call it spend, save, and donate just because my memory failed me and the way that it's explained in the book is spend, save, give. Um, so it can be spend, save, give, spend, save, donate, spend, save, share, whatever works for you guys and means something to your child. So the way that I do it based on the book is give them a weekly allowance. It can be like 50 cents to a dollar per um, age. So Gabrielle gets $7 every week. So she made, <coughs> excuse me, these three jars, I got her these three, actually she picked them out. I, I got her involved in it. I didn't just give her the jars and write everything. I wanted her to do something for it. So she picked them out. I put these little stickers on it and she wrote spend, save, donate on it. And she's supposed to divide it evenly. Um, let's come back here to the bottom. Expect some creative math. There's some creative math. The things that somehow get in donate somehow move over to the spend jar. Um, so it's going to happen, and that's okay. You know, it's just it creates an opportunity to learn when there's a mistake with something like that. Um, give them an the opportunity to make the extra chores or do the extra chores. So again, this is the entrepreneur versus just the worker bee, and don't expect perfection. <coughs> Including for the adults, there are weeks I forget to put money in it. So I owe her a little bit of money. So maybe you could put, I'm gonna do it for myself also, put something in your calendar um, to remind you, and then they'll get to an angel that'll remind you. These are just a couple ideas 
um, like birthday party craziness, give yourself permission to stop attending and throwing the over top over the top birthday parties. So I actually, Gabrielle wanted to have, there's this place, Chelsea Piers, I know you have it here, but in Connecticut, and they do all these crazy birthday parties. It's like, a, it's expensive, it's crazy. And I know it's different also for folks in the city because you don't want everybody in your apartment. Um, maybe it's not the same amount of space, you want to throw people outside in the backyard. Um, but it does get expensive. And she wanted like a Taylor Swift birthday party at Chelsea Piers. We'd gone to like Katy Perry, so thank God at least she likes um, Taylor Swift instead of Katy Perry, um, whatever, clothes-wise and stuff. So, um, yeah, so I said, Gabrielle, that's, it's really expensive. And I said, we can afford it. But I, and I didn't want to say, we can't afford it, because I feel like that's lying about it. I'm like, you know what, it's very expensive. And I told her how much it cost. And now she knows how much things cost, because she does the spend, save, share jars. So I'm like, that's like $350 or whatever it was to do that. Um, and another way that money thing really works is she was messing, she has a tutor sometimes. So the tutor came over and she was messing around I'm like, Gabrielle, like that was a lot of money for her to be here. And I told her how much it was. And I was just like, oh my gosh. I'm like, because I told her like, listen, next time you do it, I'm not gonna do it now because I want to prepare you for it. I'm gonna take money from your allowance or you're gonna have to give me money to make up for that because you wasted Mrs. Geronda's time and wasted my time. So how hardcore do you want to, I, I don't have to use it all the time. It's just good lessons for her to learn. And it was, I don't know, it was annoying. She was listening. Um, only go to the parties of close friends. That's kind of our rule, unless she really wants to go. And I'll ask her, like, do you want to go to so-and-so's party? Do you want to go to this person's party? Um, so that's one thing. If you must throw a party, this uh, consider asking the guest. Oh, we did this a for a couple of years, because I didn't want so many toys. Um, bring a toy or book to donate to a child in need. And I put that on the invitation. And then Gabrielle was able to pick two to three presents, you know, because I, I, I didn't want her to totally go without, but, you know, I wanted people to know, not, I didn't want people to know what we were doing. It wasn't like I was being like, oh, you know, we're, we're donating. I, it wasn't like I was putting judgment on anybody else. It's just how we chose to raise our child, and I didn't want so much junk in our house also because they just don't, they don't value it when you have 20. Like these kids' birthday parties are like 30 people. Oops, okay, I'm gonna move along. Um, so we did a birthday party. I told her she could invite six or seven people because some schools have the rules. You have to either invite less than half of the class or all, everybody. So, um, so I told her she could choose who she wanted. Again, this is like almost like another way of budgeting or having her make choices. So you're teaching them to make choices that are important to them. Holidays, okay, so we have a budget. It's, I say it's 200, obviously, sometimes it scoots a little north of that, and that's for Santa and for gifts. Um, maybe that's high, you know, compared to what you think is high, maybe it's low, I don't, I'm not sure, it's just, I don't even know where I got this number, I just kind of, I don't know, I need it up. Um, so I had her make a list for Santa, Instead of getting things for them that you think they'll want, it'll mean more to them if they have a gift that they asked for. And I tell her, I'm like, okay, well, Santa and I are going to talk, and we're going to agree what we're each going to give you. So then I can kind of share Santa's list. Um, vacations and special outings. I mentioned this to you before about Disney or whatever. Uh, wherever you go, they really do take the time. They really do value it more. Okay. So here's the whole end of this. So that's great. Thank you very much for giving me that information, but how do I make them do that? Um, there can be power struggles. You'll get in that a revenge cycle. So um, a revenge cycle, I'm sure you can understand what that is. You're mad at them, and they get back at you, and back and forth, and back and forth. So we want to prevent that. So that's how part of um, How to Talk to Your Kids and Positive Discipline, which are two books I highly recommend. I really learned from them. I'm a big believer in audiobooks. Um, so you can either put it on your iPod. Sorry, oh my god, what's it called? Your iPhone. I'm thinking back like several years. So you can put on that. Um, I put like a CD, I still have a CD. I put it in my car, I listen to that. 
if I'm ever rusty, I'm like, oh my God, something's going on. Like, I'm not doing my best job. I'll listen to this how to talk to kids so your kids will listen. And it's like an hour, and I'll listen to it. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'll listen to it a couple of times. I'm like, all right, I got it again. Um, all right, so the family meeting. Make a plan together. Ask them what they think they could do. And you can start it by having them come up with an idea first. And then you can write everything down, and then you go through the list together and agree on what should be in there and what should not. Now, you're not the boss anymore. They're not going to get mad at you as much. Um, the plan becomes the boss. So by saying that, look, that's what you agreed to in, in our plan. You know, at our meeting, you agreed to do that. It works. Sometimes it's not, you know, especially the further along you get, but it does work. Set yourself up for success. Not just you, uh, not just your child, for yourself as well. Take time to calmly teach them how to do it. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. That is probably one of the hugest things. Really take the time because you may think, oh, why, why can't they figure out that? It's just wiping a rag on the table. Just teach them how to do it. And yes, maybe it'll be partially they don't know, maybe partially they just don't want to do it. By teaching them, they know it. Take it slow, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and address a couple things at a time. This is huge. Believe in them and let them know that they're loved. Have faith in them. I know you can do it. Okay. <clears throat> Sometimes Gabby will be like, "I can't do it. I don't know. What I, I don't know what to do." I'm like I have faith in you. I'm like, I know you can do it, and she can do it. She does it almost every single time. But sometimes I need to help her with something. And a big thing there is also listen. Sometimes we feel like our kids are just being insolent or whatever, just for the fun of it. And sometimes they don't hear. They don't understand. Whatever. Like if she's in the back seat of the car, I'll be talking to her. And it's so annoying if she doesn't answer me. So instead of yelling at her, I'll be like, how come you're not answering me? Like, in not, not like a mean way or anything. She's like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I just wasn't listening. Or I couldn't hear you. And it's it's sincere. Or they're zoning. I mean, think about after work. Like, we're probably zoning too. Um, love and cuddles. So you want to have a balance of respect and love um, and also positive discipline. And I mentioned to the sad, mad, glad journal. So a lot of hugs. You can't give too many hugs. When I say lavish time and attention, or, or uh, time and, what did I say? I don't even remember what my own presentation was, but you know what I mean. Um, that part, you, you can't give enough hugs. That's great. Delivery matters. So this is what I was talking about with how you say something to them. Avoid commands like, why can't you do it? You know, maybe you're not going to yell at first, but like, it's time, you know, do this. I want you to do that. Instead, like, maybe she'll drop milk on the floor or something. Instead of being like, clean that up right now. Let them kind of figure out what they have to do. Like, uh, Gabrielle, what do you think you need to do about that? And she'll be, be like, um, clean it up. And then she'll clean it up. Like, nine times out of ten, she's going to clean it up. Say it with respect. Um, say it with a word. So the fewer words, the better. Because they don't want to hear you nag. Like, Go back to your childhood. Like, think about if somebody was telling you what to do, like, ah, what to, or even like a coworker, a friend, if somebody's telling you, or your mother, whatever, they're telling you a million things to do, you kind of tune them out. So, with a word, like Gabrielle, milk, or something like that, to clean it up. Describe the situation. She'll leave the refrigerator door open a lot. Um, so, describe the situation like food goes bad and you leave the refrigerator door open. So instead of being like, will you close that door or whatever, however, maybe you'd say it nice and that whatever, just I find it works when I tell her. And I'm teaching her. This is why. It's like, okay, close the door. What kind of information is that giving her? It's not. By telling her what the effect is of her actions, it's helpful. Give a choice or the illusion of a choice. Like, you can do your homework now or you can do it at 4.30 when I'm available. Something like that. Incentives rather than bribes, so if they have enough time, um, so if you give them an hour to do something, if you finish this by in 20 minutes, then you'll have like 40 minutes to watch um, Powerpuff or whatever. Don't lecture, nag, scold, threaten, yell, and don't get drawn in. Um, avoid power struggles and revenge cycles. It's so hard sometimes, and it's okay if you're angry and annoyed, and to tell them that. It's okay. Um, and to walk away until you're calm. So something I do with her is I'll always start with, I understand why XXX, why you're feeling that way, 
why do you want to do whatever? But then I followed up with, but I'm really furious right now, or I'm so angry right now, and I try not to say I'm angry at you. I just want to help her understand how I'm feeling. And she seems to get it, and she started doing it with Edward, with my husband, the other day. She explained why she, um, she was really upset about something, she was being difficult, um, it was really hot, and she was like, I don't want to be here, and she was being so tough. And she said, Daddy, I'm really sorry about the other day. We were there, and it was just so hot, and I just wanted to leave. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing my job. Um, but it was great because she was feeling what other people are feeling and understanding how she was feeling herself. And then I, I walk away sometimes like, you know what, I, don't want, I can't talk about this right now. I'm just really angry. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. Or we'll talk about it at family meeting or whatever. And write down things for your topics for family meetings if that's helpful. You can put it on the fridge. Oh, I think that's it. Um, oh. Um, I think we're out of time anyway. I have like two minutes. Um, I have it in my thing here. Just pick one or two things at home. Try the audiobooks. Just some. I, my last slide was making it stick. So consistency and cons consequences. Even though you're speaking kindly, they still have to have consequences. Preferably natural consequences. Have them feel the result of their actions. You didn't forget. You forgot your bathing suit. Well, now your consequence is you're not going to be able to go swimming with everybody. Um, do what you say you're going to do. It's so easy to not to try. I know sometimes you're not going to. Okay, it's not about perfection. Welcome mistakes. This is huge. Welcome mistakes as opportunities to learn and teach. Don't expect perfection from them or yourself. Um, you're teaching and learning, so you are learning and creating habits. And keep the balance of love and respect and discipline. And also um, lead by example. Okay, and welcome the questions. Okay. Um, what questions do you guys have? Are you thinking about all the things that you're planning on doing when you get home? <laughs> okay, thank you so much guys for coming. It was great having you. I hope that you were able to take a couple things away from this and apply it. Um, in your own home.